So I'm going to finish reading and then uh, discuss what the implications of this are. <clears throat> what stands at issue, once again, is the repudiation of reductionism based upon the breaking up of a whole and its subsequent demotion to the sum of the resultant parts. As always, what is lost in the bargain is precisely the substantial form of the whole in question, a matter to which we shall return in the sequel. For the moment it suffices to observe that the shift from the receptors and afferent nerve bundles to the newly conceived perceptual system, the eye-head-brain-body complex, obviates the need for a little man and absolves us also from having to explain how one constructs a phenomenal environment out of spots differing in brightness and color. The crucial point is that one is now confronted not by an assemblage of neurons, each in its own state, but by a perceptual system which does not in fact reduce to the sum of its parts. So, the standard uh, sort of reductionist theory of visual perception and of sensory perception generally is that the brain represents or creates an internal mental picture of the world that is deduced from uh, sensory stimulus, you know, rods and cones in the retina, catch photons, and translate that into, you know, through some sort of chemical, electrochemical um, mechanism, translate the impact from the photon into the sensation and through billions of interactions between neurons in the brain that are networked in a peculiar way, somehow an image, an experience, a representation of the outside world, the physical environment, the mind-independent universe of natural science, somehow an inner picture is made of that, a replica, an image. Um, and it's interesting, there's a sort of ir irony to this picture that scientific naturalism paints of the way perception works, because it, what it says is that the world that we experience as human beings, as you know, the, the world that the soul actually encounters, is a mirage, it's a mimicry. It's what our brain is able to clumsily construct for us based upon sensory instruments which have evolved in a completely contingent way according to you know, Darwin's theory of uh, natural selection. I mean, not completely contingent, what allowed the organism to best survive, right? Uh, so the fact that our eyes allow us to see so clearly would be no surprise. But can we be sure they're seeing clearly? Because what is it that the eyes are trying to see? You know, if all that we are conscious of is what our brain is doing, we don't really know anything about the external world. And so the irony of the position of the scientific materialist on perception is that they, they end up pulling out the epistemological rug from underneath their own feet. Um, but not only that, uh, it's an alienating picture that when uh, adopted, when, when our worldview is based upon a scientific materialism, um, we end up having to assume a sort of schizophrenic uh, position because, you know, like the scientist while on the job in the laboratory, the neuroscientists, you know, studying the physiology of 
consciousness, the physiological correlates of consciousness, or the physiological cause of consciousness, as the materialist would put it, um, you know, may think certain things about the mechanisms responsible for human behavior and human emotion, but then when they go home and, they, you know, see their wife and, and their families and, you know, when they engage in their private passions of whatever form of artistic endeavor or sport or, you know, when they engage in their non-scientific human existence, um, they're no longer able to understand the world in the way that they were able to in the laboratory with that sort of disinterested distance. Um, and so, you know, it's not that a scientific materialist is necessarily an immoral person. It's not necessarily true that civilization would, would collapse if everyone were atheist. Or, I'm not suggesting that. But it, it's that it leads to an inconsistency and a cognitive dissonance when we try to hold both the truth, the supposed truths about the nature of human life and the universe provided to us by natural science, when we try to hold that together with uh, the moral underpinnings of our Western civilization, we end up uh, in a very tight, tense uh, place. And, and you know, you, you, we see this playing out in the political sphere, in the political arena, this, this tension. I mean, it's not different kinds, fundamentally different kinds of people, like, you know, the, the new atheists and the Christian fundamentalists. They're not fundamentally different kinds of people. The reason that this conflict is playing itself out publicly is because privately the Christians and the atheists are dealing with the same split, the same dissonance. Um, so we're, you know, we're seeing the symptoms of this sort of bifurcated um, existence of the Western psyche at this point in history. Where on the one hand we think, you know, the average intelligent person today thinks that science has shown that consciousness is a brain activity, and that when we die, that's it. And so, really, the only ethic we could have would be a utilitarian ethic, just sort of a market ethic, a capitalist ethic. Um, we should seek the pleasure for ourselves, and part of seeking pleasure for ourselves, for our you know bodily pleasures, is is making sure others can have their pleasures met. So we form, you know, reasonable societies based upon this pleasure-seeking principle. But it's this utilitarian ethic is ultimately, uh, well, there's no there's no ultimate good, really. And while civilization won't collapse, because you know all of industrialism the past few hundred years has been based on this ethic and so it's worked for a while I mean obviously it's collapsing <laughs> all around us at the particular at this particular moment and it's destroyed the ecosystem and disintegrated our or in large part has disintegrated the, like our cultural roots and the meaning which has sustained us for so long and much of the meaning that has sustained us in the tradition needed to be have the thickets, the weeds cleared out, but I think it's gone a little too far. Of course, you know, the major guiding institution for 1500 years for the West, the Catholic Church, is just completely inept and uh, morally bankrupt at this point, right? So we need something completely new. It isn't like religion, as it has traditionally been practiced by human beings. Um, but somehow we need to heal this bifurcation, heal the split, 
between the feeling and intuitive side of our being and the thinking and sensing side of our being. Uh, you know, we need to bring art and spirituality and science back into a healthy relationship with one another. And in all my efforts to try to bring them together, I would never want to come off as being demeaning or disrespectful or, or not recognizing the power of science and the uh, explanatory power and the technological power of science. I recognize it. I think it's a mistake, though, to hypothesize it or to metaphysicalize a methodology. Science is a, is a way of looking at the world in a way of interacting with the world in order to derive certain predictable uh, knowledge, certain, certain forms of knowledge about how nature behaves and how to manipulate it so as to get it to behave in desired ways. Um, but this is different than knowledge of things themselves. It's different than, it's not the same as, um, you know, ontology. It's not this, it's, you, you can't really have a complete cosmology, complete conception of the universe as a whole, which includes the human being and human consciousness, as well as um, the physical world. If, if you're only going to remain with the scientific methodology. I mean, scientific methodology will give you insight into the sector of reality, but we still have to understand how our perception of the world around us um, comes to be experienced by this inner um, existence which we are, this soul. You know, there is an outer world to be studied by natural science, but there is also an inner world, and it is the inner world upon which all our knowledge of the outer world rests. And knowledge is a, coming to know nature is a spiritual activity. How does, how does the scientist know what he or she knows about the natural world? What is that knowledge exactly? It's not just like stuff on a page in a journal. It's, it's a human being having an experience of the truth of the universe. That's, um, you know, something very profound is going on. And I would never want to demean that. Um, I never am attacking science. I'm attacking scientific materialism. The worldview which results when we mistake our models of a machine-like, uh, entirely de-souled and disenchanted universe. We, we mistake the model for our actual experience, which is always something that we care about. We're, we're, we're interested in it. Um, it has meaning. You know. And, and we are beings that think freely and feel uh, and have will. Science doesn't recognize any of these things. It assumes them, but they're not part of the mechanical theories that it builds um, and it constructs these models. Maybe, I mean, to the limited, most limited extent they are. I mean, the neurophysiologist still has to talk about sensation or it can't get or they wouldn't be able to get their theory of perception off the ground but um, you know, for the most part science has to remain a methodology so that um, other modes of human inquiry can begin to fill in the rest of the um, conceptual environment it situates the human spirit in the natural universe so uh, yeah, you know, thanks for listening to me. <laughs>